I have been anticipating and looking forward to this for the last three years since I was invited. And it's just great to see what God is doing around the world. Do you believe that God is working around the world? Yes. He is working around the world. One of the privileges of my position is to travel to different parts of the world and to see the blessings of God as He uses men and women uh, to reach others for Jesus Christ. In the last 64 years of the Baptist Bible Fellowship, we have seen more than 15,000 churches started outside of the United States, and we have processed from our churches in America nearly $900 million and we have sent out over 3,000 missionaries. And so God has blessed uh, our efforts because our early founders believed in missions. And because those pastors believed in missions, I believe that God has blessed our churches there. And I see the same thing happening in the Philippine Islands. Because you are interested in missions, God is blessing you and your country. And I believe that you are able to surpass all the things that we have done uh, from the United States. And the reason why I can say that is because God is able and our God is your God and he's the great God and he's the only true and living God. And so we are great to partner with you in reaching the world. There are things and places you, cannot, you can go that we cannot go and there are some places and things we can do that you cannot do. But together, we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. He gave us the Great Commission. And he gave it to us with all power in Jesus Christ. And we can accomplish it together. And so it's wonderful to see the many pastors and the missionaries and the church people that are participating this week. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. It's a very simple message tonight. Very simple message entitled, Have You Caught the Vision? Have You Caught the Vision? And we'll read Acts chapter 16 beginning with verse 9. Let's stand together as we've, as we've done this morning. Acts chapter 16, follow along as I read verses 9 through 12. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There's, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that day, in that city, abiding certain days. Our Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you would bless the preaching of your word. We have already sung our praises unto you because you are worthy of them. Now, Father, we ask that you would speak to us and prick our hearts to do more for the cause of world missions. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. World missions is the very heartbeat of God. He still calls people to certain places to share the wonderful news of Jesus Christ to certain people. I deal a lot with missions. I preach about missions a lot. I read a lot of subjects, a lot of articles about missions. I am consumed with missions, not just because it is my position, but because I know it is the heartbeat of God himself. One of the passages in the Bible that I'm always amazed with is found here in Acts chapter 16, the verses we have read. I really love these verses and what God was doing in them. The, the phrase that I, I like is found in verse 10, 
And it says, and after he had seen the vision. After he had seen the vision. This is where Paul senses the call of God upon his life to take the gospel to Europe. And this was actually his second missionary journey. And it's interesting how things began to unfold as the Holy Spirit worked in the life of Paul. You see, Paul and his team had planned to preach in Asia. And as they were beginning to go to Asia, the Holy Spirit prevented them from going to Asia. I don't know why that is true, but that is what happened according to the scripture. And so then they planned to go to Bithynia. As they were going to Bithynia, then the Holy Spirit would not allow them to go into Bithynia. And then they heard the cry from Macedonia. And the gospel entered into Europe through Macedonia, and you know the rest of the story. From Europe, it went through other parts of the world, on over to, into Asia, and now we see it from Asia going to everywhere in the world. I like what someone said. They said, missions used to be from, from the west to the rest. From the west to the rest. But that's not true anymore today, is it? Today it's from everywhere to everyone. And that's what world missions is today. Now, the thing to note is that Paul was always staying on the move. He was always going forward serving God. Then one night a vision came to him. Look at verse 9. It says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. The question I have for you tonight, and we'll be asking this question through the message, is have you caught the vision of people calling for help? People around the world calling for help. And they're doing that in so many different ways. Uh, recently, I went to the country of Madagascar. And as I went to Madagascar, I don't know if we have the pictures. Madagascar, are we ready? A little bit behind here. Anyways, when most people think about Madagascar, what do you think about? Think about these cartoon animals. And uh, with the movies that were out about Madagascar. But actually, Madagascar is a, an island off of Africa. And there are 22 million people that live in Madagascar. The central, this, you need to keep going. The central, uh, the capital city is Antananarivo. It's very hard to say. Antananarivo. In fact, they say Tana. They just call it Tana. But there are many people, over 4 million people that live in this city. There is, at this point, one independent Baptist church in that city and a few Southern Baptist churches in the whole island. People have descended in this island from Indonesia. Very interesting. It's near Africa, but most of their descendants came from Indonesia. And so they have that appearance. They have many different kinds of religion, but the largest one is Catholicism. But most of the people worship their ancestors. They have particular days when they have these pictures of their ancestors and they go around the cities singing their songs and praying prayers to their ancestors. So that is just one area of the world that we see the great need for the gospel in Madagascar. Have you heard the calling of God from the people of Madagascar who are saying, please come over and help us? Please come over and help us. They don't know what they're asking for. They're just looking for help. But the one who can help them is Jesus Christ. They're trying all kinds of things, even praying to their ancestors and doing all kinds of other religious activities, trying to say, help us. But the only one that can help is Jesus Christ. Have you heard them calling? Have you heard the call of God to go and tell? Our world today has more than 7 billion people. They say in October 2012, October 2012, the 7 billionth person was born. 
They say that seven billionth person was either born in Asia or in Africa. We don't know for sure. But somewhere they say the seven billionth person was born. When I went into Madagascar, I also went to the country of Namibia. The country of Namibia. Namibia is in the southwestern part of Africa. By the way, we have, the Baptist Bible Fellowship has never had a missionary to Madagascar. We need missionaries to Madagascar. Then I went to Namibia. Namibia is in the southwest part of Africa, and it is known for one of the most uh, famous deserts, the Kalahari Desert. And it's a very large desert. Most of the country is in desert. Has, is the, the, uh, the, the landscape is desert. They have two million people that live in Namibia. There are many remote people, many people that are tribal people that live in Namibia. They are the indigenous people that are there, and so they are, they are there to reach the gospel. Remote people need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Namibia used to be a colony of Germany, and so there are German uh, ranchers there, but they are telling me and other people, if you will send someone with the gospel, we will give you property so you can have facilities to reach out to the uh, upper class people and to the tribal people so the opportunities are there the capital city is called Windhoek Windhoek and it is a very beautiful city although there are only 350,000 people in that city there are many people uh, from different nationalities that live in Namibia and all of them get together and get along very well and so there are all these people in Namibia and then there are a few cities other cities on the coast on the coastal area of Namibia the largest re religion there is Lutheran and then Catholicism and then many cults many cults have entered into Namibia there's only three Baptist churches in all of Namibia they need the gospel of Jesus Christ they're calling out for help they're saying, who will come and help us and tell, and tell us about Jesus Christ? It wasn't until Paul had seen the vision that he went out with the gospel and what he knew was to the ends of the world. Notice in verse 10. In verse 10 it says, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. It is, said, it is said that before every great spiritual accomplishment, God gives a vision for the task. Before every great spiritual accomplishment, God gives a vision for the task. When God called Abraham to, take, to pack his bags and take his family and go to where God would show him, God gave him a vision that his seed would be as many as the stars in the sky. When God called Joseph, he gave, a, gave him a vision that the crops would bow down before him. What about you tonight? Has God given you an idea of what God wants to do in your life, in your ministry, in your city, or in the country that God has called you to? I think it's important to notice how Paul responded to the vision that came to him in verse 10. Notice in verse 10, his response was, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. When God called him, immediately they were ready to go. Abraham did the same. Abraham didn't argue with God. When God said, I want you to get your family together and then go to where I, have, I want you to go, he didn't even know where it was. But he told his family, God is called, so pack your bags and let's go. It was the same for Abraham. And God told the same thing to Paul, and I want you to go into Macedonia. And it says, immediately we endeavored to go. God is still calling people because there are still billions of people who are yet to hear a presentation of Jesus Christ. Now there are some key things, some important things that I want to share with you from these verses. Very quickly, I'll try and go quickly because I have eight points. 
eight points. So be ready. Be ready. My first point tonight is this. The call to missions is personal. The call to missions is personal. In verse 9 it says, a vision appeared to Paul. It was personally to Paul. God's vision for missions is personal. He wants everyone to be involved in missions. Every pastor should be involved in missions. Every church should be involved in missions. If your church is not involved in missions, then your church does not have a right to exist. Because the heartbeat of God is to have all the people around the world hear about Jesus Christ. And so the missions, the call to missions is personal. Uh, it reveals to us that God works to us on a personal basis. In fact, I have seen many times that when missionaries are on the mission field and when pastors are pastoring churches, that when troubles come and hard times come, the only thing that keeps them there is the call of God personally in their lives. I heard a missionary say the other day that he was struggling, having problems, and someone told him, just go home. Just go home. And he said, I can't go home because God called me to this place. And so I can't go home because the call is personal. It's also interesting to note that this call did not come to him while he was hiding in a cave or waiting for God just to speak to him. No, Paul was very active. And that, it did not come to him when he was sitting in a monastery just waiting for God to do something. It came to him when he was active, when he was on the move, when he was serving God, when he was making a difference right where he was, that's when God gave the call to him to go and serve. In fact, it came when he was taking risks for God. Have you ever taken a risk for God? In Acts chapter 15, verse 25 and 26, it says, It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to, cho to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that hazarded, hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever hazarded your life for Jesus Christ? You see, Paul and Barnabas were putting their lives at risk for their Savior, and that's what God wants to see when we give our life to Him. That's when He'll call us and use us. Have you risked giving your possessions to God? Have you risked giving your finances to God? You see, when you give to missions, you're giving not what belongs to you, but you give what belongs to God to missions. But I find that so many people, they don't see it as personal, and so they hope someone else will give to missions. But God wants every one of us to be involved in giving to missions. But I find many times that we give what we have left over to God. Well, I have this need and I have these needs. I have these bills. I have these things to take care of. And whatever is left over, I'll give to God. Do you like eating things that are left over? Do you like things that are left over? Why do we give God what is left over? We should be serving God, risking our lives for God, risking things for world missions. That's what Paul was doing. He was willing to go when God called him. So I ask you the question tonight. Have you heard the vision? Have you heard people calling for help? Have you heard about world missions and said, I'll do whatever I can do for missions? The second point tonight is this. The call to missions is urgent. The call to missions is urgent. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 9 it says, There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Come over and help us. Now this was a vision of a man pleading with him, pleading with him, please come over and help us. It was as if he was standing before him and continuously pleaded, oh, please come and help. Please come and help. 
The world is searching for the truth in so many different ways. You can go to Nepal today, and they have a lot of Eastern religions. Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, all kinds of religious, uh, all kinds of different religions and things that are going on. They do all kinds of rituals. They do all kinds of things because they're trying to find something to fill the void in their life. They'll do all kinds of things to supposedly have their sins and their burdens lifted from them. But let me tell you tonight, the only one that can do that is Jesus Christ. For so many years in Nepal, Christianity was illegal. I went there in, in the year 2000, and I could sense the darkness, the spiritual darkness in Nepal. Everywhere I went, it was just heavy. The Hinduism and all these other things, it was heavy. Well, I recently went back there. Now we have churches that are started. The light of the gospel is shining, and the spiritual darkness is beginning to go away because people there pleaded for help, People answered the call, and immediately they took the gospel to Nepal. The devil is giving all kinds of false ways to blind people from the truth. Millions are pleading for God's people to come over and help them. Millions are pleading for help. You'll see them around the world today. They will ring the bells. They ring the bells to scare the evil spirits away. They spin their prayer wheels and they pray hoping someone somewhere out there will answer their prayers. They cremate and burn their loved ones and then they take their ashes and sweep them into a river hoping that the water will take them down for reincarnation until they'll find enlightenment. The only light that will help them is Jesus Christ. Not any other kind of religious enlightenment. They wash their sins away. They believe to wash their sins away in holy rivers. You can see that in India and in different parts of the world. In parts of Kenya, they beat the drums at night and they sing and they, they try and do all kinds of things to appease the evil spirits because they live in great fear. In Nepal, you can go and see the all-seeing eye of Buddha. It's a large shrine with eyes that go all the way around. And they believe that Buddha can see everything around the world. Can I tell you today that Buddha is dead? He can't see anything. But our Savior is alive. And that's what people need to hear about is Jesus Christ. You can go and have monks pray over you and... and uh, they can pray all they want, but their prayers are going to someone who is dead today. And so people are trying all kinds of things. And because they're doing all these things, it is their way of saying, come over and help us. Come over and help us. They just don't know it is Jesus that they are looking for. To these people, it's all a matter of life and death. They fear the unknown. They don't know what's going to happen after they die. And so you have to see what Paul saw. Have you heard the call to take the gospel? Have you heard the cry of people around the world saying, come over and help us? They are in the dark. We must go. We must go and take the gospel to them. It is urgent because many are dying without the gospel and they're going into an eternal separation from God in a place called hell so the call is urgent number three number three the call to missions is also exact it's also exact it says in verse 9 a man from Macedonia this call from God revealed to Paul exactly where God wanted him to go it was exact it was Macedonia it was clear God's will for each of us is exact. It is very clear. God has a plan for every one of us, and He knows where we, He wants us to serve. When I was in college, I had surrendered to be a missionary. First of all, I went to college to study television production. I wanted to travel around the world 
videotape missionaries and show their stories on television in America. So I went to college to study television production. During my sophomore year, God had been working in my life, had been bringing different people my way, began to show me things that he wanted me to be a missionary. And we had a missions emphasis week at college. And we had a speaker. I don't know if you've ever heard of this man, but the man's name that day that was speaking was Jack Baskin. Have you ever heard of him? He was preaching that day. And he said this, if God has not called you to America, then you must go somewhere else. Wow. That was speaking to me. I didn't even want to be in America. I grew up in Africa. And I knew God had not called me to America, so I went forward that day and I surrendered my life to be a missionary. I began to pray and seek what God would have me to do, where he wanted me to go. I was born in Ethiopia. No, I don't look like an Ethiopian. But I was born in Ethiopia. I lived in Kenya. And I prayed, God, please show me where you want me to go. And it became very clear and very evident exactly where he wanted me to go. And he sent me to the field of Kenya. And I thank the Lord for those years that I had serving God. Do you know the voice of God when he speaks to you? Do you know what the voice of God sounds like? Do you see when God speaks to you, it will be exactly where he wants you to go. John chapter 10 and verse 3 and 4. John 10 verse 3 and 4 it says, To him the porters openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Do you know the voice of God tonight? This exact calling for Paul to Macedonia was really a turning point in the history of the world. Paul had started toward Asia, then turned toward Europe, and the gospel went to Europe, and it has spread around the world. And so Europe became the center for Christianity. Now God knows what he is doing. Why didn't he come to Asia first? I don't know. But God knows what he's doing. He has a plan. And he has an exact plan that for all of us to fit the picture of what he has for us. It doesn't matter tonight if you're a doctor. It doesn't matter tonight if you're a housewife. It doesn't matter tonight if you're a student or if you're a businessman or a businesswoman. It doesn't matter what you are. God has a plan for you. And it is exact for you. And no matter what your proficient, your profession is, you must be involved in world missions. So do you hear what God is calling tonight? Do you hear the people of the world calling tonight? Have you heard the call for help around the world? Number four. Number four, the call to missions is very simple. It's very simple. It says in verse 9, help us. Help us. It's very simple. Help us. We're not called to sit. We're not called to go and do some other things. This call to missions is very simple and it's very basic. And the people around the world need to hear the way, the truth, and the life. The man of Macedonia was calling for help. Calling for help. The cry of the world is, come over here and help us. Come over here and help us. When I went to China, we met a lady out in the mountains and she had her own uh, medical pharmacy. And she said, please bring a medical team over to my city so that you can reach the physical needs of my people. But she said, most of all, I know there's something different about you. Bring the story of your God to my people. That's what they're really asking for. Oh, they might think they need help physically, but they need a greater help spiritually, and that is Jesus Christ. In Kenya today, there are still tribes that have not been reached. And when I was there a few years ago, one of the men said, 
please send more missionaries. My people in the mountains need to hear about Jesus Christ. He was calling out for help, calling out for help. In Cambodia, there are still people calling out for help. We have missionaries there today, but there's still many more who are calling out for help. In Colombia, South America, which is wide open to the gospel, they're calling out for help. They're saying, please send the truth to us. Send the truth to us. I was in Mongolia this summer in June. I was in Mongolia. And there the people were saying, please send us more missionaries. Do you know what they mean when they say that? Please help us. Please help us. Do you know the Korea BBF, the Korea BBF, has been there for 20 years. 20 years. I went there to celebrate their 20 years. They have started churches. They have a university that is the most well-known university in Mongolia that the Korean BBF missionary started. The Korean government helped to build it. God is able to do great things even in Mongolia. But they're begging for more help. They need more help. This is true all over the world. The call and the plan is very simple. We must go and help them. Number five, the call to missions is providential. It is providential. It says in verse 10, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us. It is providential. God is the one. Aren't you glad that God is able? Aren't you glad it's not John Connor up is able? If it was John Connor up is able, we would be in trouble. But it's God that is able. And this call to missions is from God. It is providential. It was a very clear directive, no doubt about it. It was clear that God had called Paul to go. Paul was spiritually, he was a spiritually mature man who followed the Spirit's leading. When he couldn't go into Asia, he didn't say, okay, I guess I tried, so that's all. No, he kept trying. He kept following God, kept serving God until he knew exactly where God wanted him to be. We must stay on the move while we are spiritually sensitive to God's leading. Paul was, Paul was not rebuked for attempting to go to another place. They were just not the same place that God wanted him at first. He wanted to go to Asia, but God wanted him to go to Macedonia. And it was in his time that he knew. It was in his time. Later, God revealed when he came to him in a vision. The important thing to understand here is that God's time and his timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Uh, he, he knows everything. He has the whole picture in mind. And so when he calls us and he tells us what to do, it's like putting a puzzle together, all the different pieces. Unfortunately, there are some people who hear the call of God and they don't follow it. Then you have the picture with a few pieces missing because some people haven't answered the call of God. And so God will do it in his time. Notice in verse 10 it says the words, assuredly gathering. Assuredly gathering. This has the idea that it all came together. Because it's from God, it all came together. God's call confirmed what God wanted Paul to do. We see this in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 31. It says in Isaiah 30 and verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, when ye turn to the left hand. When God calls, it is of the, from the great God who created the universe, and when he speaks, then we must listen. Do you hear the voice of God leading you and calling you? The only way this can be done is when we are on the move and serving God, doing what is right. I have experienced 
God's leading in my life. I have experienced when he wanted me to change from one place and go to another place. It was like a still, small voice. And when he directed me and I started following him, it was as if he was saying, yes, you're in the right place. Isn't it wonderful to be in the right place? Oh, it's wonderful when you're in the will of God. And it doesn't mean that you won't have problems. But when you know you're in the will of God, you know that God will watch over and protect you. When I was a missionary in Kenya, I went back to the United States on furlough to report to our churches. And I met with Dr. Baird, our former mission director. We had lunch. And at lunch, he said, John, I would like you to consider working in the mission office. My first response was, why would I want to do that? I've lived in Africa. I've served in Africa. Started churches. We just started a Bible college. It's going great. Why would I leave the mission field to live in the United States? He said, pray about it. I said, okay. I'll pray about it. So I prayed about it. And for four months, I prayed about it. And finally, I felt that God was leading me to change from Kenya to the mission office. It was the still, small voice of God that leads and directs because His call is providential. It's amazing how God's Word will confirm what you are doing according to His will. He will move you. He'll direct you. But you need to be serving Him for you to be able to hear His voice. So have you caught the vision? Have you caught the vision of world missions? Have you heard the people calling over and calling for help? Number six. Number six. Moving quickly. Number six. The call to missions is specific. It is very specific. In verse 10 it says, And the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. The call to missions is very specific. The primary purpose for missions is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not primarily to build hospitals. We are not primarily to have orphanages. We are not primarily to have feeding centers. We are not primarily to have schools or colleges. Those things are good. It's okay to do those. But that's not the main call to missions. The main call to missions is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can help with all the food that people need. You can help with all the education people need. You can build houses for people. You can do all kinds of things for people. But if they die without Jesus Christ, all of that will mean nothing to them. The deepest need of the human race is Jesus Christ. That's the call to missions. It's very, very specific to preach the gospel. After years of Paul serving God and traveling and preaching in missions, Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, referring to himself, he said, separated unto the gospel of God. That's what his primary purpose was, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This call to get the gospel out to our world is the first priority. All other projects, all other desires are secondary to preaching the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's what we present to the world. When they call and say, Please help us, the answer to their need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our calling, to preach Jesus. Number seven, number seven, the call to missions is now. The call to missions is 
now. Look at verse 10. It says, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. When? Immediately. I have met people who have received the call of God upon their lives, and they did not act immediately. They did not act immediately. And you know what happens when you don't act immediately? The devil begins to work in your mind, begins to cause doubts, begins to bring up other desires. The last thing the devil wants for you to do is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when God speaks to you to be a pastor or to be a missionary, then you must act immediately and surrender to be a missionary and then take the gospel around the world. Paul did not hesitate when God came and spoke to him. Immediately he set out on his journey to spread the gospel. Even though many sense the call is personal, and even though many people understand the mission's call is urgent, and there are people that God is calling uh, to help those who are calling out for help, many people still delay in their response to the call for help. People are calling for help, and people delay in going. Do you know what happens when we delay? People die in their sins. They die in their sins. They die in their sins. Never having another chance to be with God, to have their sins forgiven. They die in their sins. That's why we must go now. They're calling for help now. So let's go now. We must act today. We have to do it now. Accept the call now. Take the gospel now. The time is now. They're calling for us now. So now is the time to go and take the gospel. Number eight. Number eight. My last point. Number eight. The call to missions is rewarding. It is rewarding. Notice verses 11 and 12. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that port of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. There is nothing like being in the middle of the will of God. There's nothing like living a life of obedience to God. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. In verse 11, Paul says, they came with a straight course. They, they went with a straight course. This has the idea of sailing, sailing a boat, sailing against the wind, against the wind. When you go against the wind, you have to go this way, and then that way, and that way, and that way, and it takes you a lot of time before you get to your destination. Sailing against the wind. But when the wind of the Holy Spirit is behind you, when it's behind you, you put up your sail and you go straight to the other side. Straight to the other side. That's always the best way to go. With the Holy Spirit leading and guiding and you follow Him. It's like you catch the vision, you get in the will of God and you go forward and the wind of the Holy Spirit guides you and pushes you to the destination. To those who are saying, Come and help us. You go straight forward right now and you reach them with the gospel. On the other hand, there are those who sail against the wind. And many times they never reach the destination. Paul went all the way to Philippi in Macedonia. His first converts were a businesswoman named Lydia and an unnamed jailer. They became the pillars of that new church, which ended up supporting Paul as he went around to the rest of his ministry. About 12 years later, he would write them a letter from prison in Rome about the life of continual rejoicing. He wrote to that church in Philippi, 
that he reached out to them with the gospel with. And they had begun to grow. And they supported him. And many people were saved. That is the reward of missions. That is the reward of missions. When we trust and when we obey and when we follow, we also find that missions is very rewarding. When I was a missionary in Kenya, we went to a small tribe area. It was a tribe by the, they are called the Maasai. They're very well known. They're very fierce. Uh, many people are afraid of them. Uh, they fight each other with spears. They even kill lions with their spear. And so they're very, very tough people. We went into this village and we presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. The entire village came, 350 people. The chief sitting on the very front of the village, sitting there. We showed the film, the Jesus film, in their language. Then we preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of them, if not all of them, had never heard about Jesus before. Never heard of Jesus. And so we presented the gospel and we gave an invitation and we said, would anyone like to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do you know what happened? No one came forward. No one came. They just sat there. So like a good Baptist, we had another verse of invitation. And we pleaded with them again. And we told them about the love of Jesus. And we asked them to come forward. Do you know what happened? No one came. So being a good Baptist, we said, let's have another verse of invitation. So we pleaded again. We told them what Jesus did on the cross, that all the other things they do will never forgive them of their sins. Only Jesus can. We gave the invitation. Do you know what happened? The chief came forward. The chief came and said, I have never heard of this man Jesus before. I've never heard of how my sins can be forgiven. I have tried many different things and rituals and all kinds of things, but my heart is still heavy. It's empty. But today, I have finally heard of the one who can forgive me of my sins. And that day, right then, that man prayed and asked Jesus to be his Savior. That's the call to missions, isn't it? Guess what happened after that? Almost the entire village came forward and received Jesus as their Savior that day. That's the reward for missions. One day when you go to heaven, you'll stand there and you'll see this man who's a Maasai and he'll be singing praises to God and you'll say, oh, that must be the chief of that village. I heard about him. Praise God. That's the reward. From around the world, people standing, singing praises to Jesus who died on the cross for the whole world and we're going to worship him. And people from around the world will say, thank you for giving and for coming to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I ask you the question one more time. Have you caught the vision? Have you caught the vision as Paul did? People saying, come over here and help us. Come over here and help us. That's the call to missions. The call to missions. Have you heard the call tonight? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for all the pastors who are here tonight. God, I pray that you'll help them to be missions-minded pastors. Because people around the world are waiting for someone to come and help them. Their church